It is always my joy and privilege to welcome you. We're glad that you've come to worship with us today, both here in the auditorium by way of the Internet. Uh, James, thank you for that music. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. What a wonderful hymn. Stand if you would. Let's sing together. It says, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. good to see you here this morning. I um, want to encourage you to continue to pray for Brother Riley as he recovers from his uh, knee surgery this week. Um, this morning I'm going to share with you a passage of scripture uh, from Matthew 21 that ties in with the message I'm going to be preaching to you this morning. Um, verse 2, uh, Jesus tells his disciples, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now, those words struck me this morning as I meditated on them, a beast of burden. You know, to, to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus is not easy. He came into Israel mounted on a beast of burden to bear the sins of the world. And if you think it's going to be easy to follow him, well, you better wake up. That's not an easy task at all. And so that's what our message is this morning. Uh, I, I stole it from uh, George Washington, General George Washington. Uh, remember the cause. That's what, it, that's what we're here to do is to remember what we are to be about. And so let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you uh, for this day. We thank you for this day that we have to encourage one another. And as your word says, to stir one another up to do the things that we ought to be doing, to live the way that we ought to be living, and to give you all the glory and honor. And so, Father, as we worship here together, Lord, may your spirit uh, be, be welcomed in this place, Lord, and in our hearts, God, and may your words speak to us. And, Lord, may we all uh, say it was good to have been in the house of the Lord this morning. And so bless our fellowship and bless this time of worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was going to try to catch you before you sat down. Uh, I had the opportunity. Well, I know Brother Riley is watching today, so if you would stand, everybody look. We've got a camera right back this way. Everybody stand and wave. Tell Brother Riley good morning. We're glad that you're here. While you're standing, if you're visiting with us in front of you, there is a, should be a visitor's card. Don't sit down. Should be a visitor's card. We ask that you take that, fill it out, place it in the offering plate later in our service. But right now, let's fellowship together as the family of God. Good morning, church. Got a good crowd this morning. I want to thank everyone for coming and the, all the hats. Well done on the hats, ladies, this morning. There are quite a few of them. I think there was a message sent out on Facebook for hat day. So if you see all the hats, that's what it's from. So uh, 
great job, ladies, on those. This afternoon, uh, starting at 4 o'clock, we have our festivities started here at the church. We'll start with Bible drill. Uh, and then 5 o'clock will be Teen Kid, Preschool Choir, and then our family focus group will be meeting where we'll start on session three with our study on new turns by Dr. Tony Evans. That is tonight. Also on Wednesday night, I don't get to mention this very often, we have our RAs and our GAs meet. Uh, we've changed things up. We now meet over in the old sanctuary. Uh, so if you have a child that is in RAs or GAs, we meet at 530 in the old sanctuary. We meet there together and then we split from there. So time change is a little bit different. It used to be 545. We're now at 530 in the old sanctuary. Brother Joe. All right, well, uh, we had our fall party uh, last Wednesday night, and it was so much fun. Uh, and so I want to say thank you to all the, the ladies who, uh, who brought us treats, because we had, we had so many of them that I wanted to start on that end uh, rather than with the dinner. And I, I, but I want to thank you all for, for bringing that and uh, supporting our student ministry that way. And uh, thank you, Ryan. He got the fire started for us. And... Uh, and so uh, we, had, we had a good time, though, and uh, so thank you all for you all supporting that. And uh, this November 16th, it's two Wednesday nights from now, um, the youth are going to help serve that evening. So for you parents out there, you know, we've told this to the kids, but to you parents out there, we, uh, we, we want to get there a little bit early um, and, and help serve. So they need to be all dressed the same, okay? Uh, they're going to be wearing blue jeans, and we're going to give them all a youth t-shirt okay a youth t-shirt so we need them to sign up we need to know their t-shirt sizes and all that good information so make sure we have that information uh, for your for your youth so that they all have a nice youth t-shirt to wear and we all match uh, that evening so that's November the 16th coming up a couple of weeks so we want to try to get everyone matching that night and uh, also remember that our camp deposit of $50 is is due as soon as you can pay it and uh, and that'll help us uh, know how many we've got going we've got 40 spots for our youth and we want to try to fill every single one of them so all right all and that's what I have. Moms and dads of first through fifth graders, today we're doing a hackathon out back. It starts right after the morning worship hour, so we need to get your kids uh, ready and have them meet uh, at, out in front of the shop back here at the back. The shop is the building in front of the Torrance Student Center, uh, but we need them out there as soon as church is over with, and uh, we're going to go out back, have uh, some hot dogs out by the pond, and then we're going to hike around for uh, until 2 o'clock, but we need you to pick them up at 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, parents. Okay. Got that. Uh, as you know, we have our Thanksgiving banquet coming up. If you've already signed up for that, uh, that's great. Just a reminder to you, that's November the 16th. That'll be Wednesday week. Uh, also, uh, parents of uh, our children, we have a new journal out for you, for the kiddos. There's more stuff in it, more things to do, and uh, to get them involved in worship. So I encourage you to uh, encourage your children to uh, fill out these journals and get them involved in the worship time. And uh, as you know, Nativity Shirt, the Nativity is right around the corner, the 8th, 9th, and 10th of December. We'll be having a set day. We'll have work days. Any retired men, uh, the week after, uh, after Thanksgiving, we'll be meeting all the uh, retired men I can get to come help. We'll be putting up sets. But also for the entire church, this is for the entire church, we are going to be giving T-shirts away. These are long, long sleeve T-shirts, and we need you to sign up today. Today's the final day. i got to get these things ordered. So if you would like a T-shirt for you and or your entire family, uh, we need you to get those uh, uh, information in. You can uh, let any, if you'll write the, your name and what sizes you need uh, on a piece of paper and get that to any of the staff members. They'll get that to me. Uh, but today is the final day for that, and they are free. And uh, it'll be celebrating our 30th year uh, nativity this year. Brother Mark. This coming Tuesday night, we will be having our Joymakers meeting. Uh, that'll meet at 6 o'clock out in our Richardson building. This is our Thanksgiving gathering. Those of you 50 years of age and above, you're invited to be a part of that. Uh, we, the church will be providing ham and dressing. We encourage you to bring uh, desserts and sides that will go with that. So if you could be a part of that, we'd love to have you uh, come be with us this coming Tuesday night. Um, also, uh, 
Brother James Latham is back towards the back. Brother James has been walking around. He's needing men to help serve as ushers. And he's talked with some of you. If he's not talked with you, and God has led you to come serve as one of our ushers, helping people as they come in the auditorium, also as we receive our offerings later on in the service, uh, if you could do that, we'd ask that you find Brother James and volunteer for that. We'd, he'd appreciate it muchly. Uh, it's good to have all of that together. Let's sing together. Hymn 304 is where we'll go. Uh, the hymns today dealt with just the glory and the majesty of Christ and his in his. He alone is worthy of our worship. It says, crown him with many crowns. Well, the Lord has blessed me over the years with two women that have made a big impact in my life. One is my wife, Norma. She's been with 50 something years. And the other one is sitting over here behind the piano. This is our daughter, Laura Nicolardi. She uh, brings greetings from the Flint Baptist Church over in Flint, Texas. That's where they attend. Her husband and uh, my two grand boys are sitting in the back over here. Thank them for coming, and uh, don't get many opportunities to work with my daughter, and uh, took advantage of this, so uh, hope you enjoy this song. <clears throat> mm -hmm. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. I want to serve you more. I want to serve you more. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. More of you. More of you. I've had all but what I need is more of you of things I've had my fill and yet I hunger still empty and bare Lord hear my prayer for more of you and whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord. That's what I'll be willing 
to do and whatever it takes to be more like you that's what I'll be willing to do I'll trade sunshine for rain laughter for pain that's what I'll be willing to do and whatever it takes to be more like you that's what I'll be willing to do yes that's what I'll be willing to do May that be our prayer always, Lord, whatever it takes to be more like you. That's what we'll be willing to do. Let's continue singing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of that glory divine. Let's sing together.
in our service where we have set aside a time for you to give of tithes and offerings. God has said to bring all the tithe into the storehouse that my house might be full. And this is the time we, offer, we gave you to do that. If you've not had an opportunity to give, we encourage you. There are offering envelopes in front of you in the pew. Or you can just leave that there. Uh, prayer now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the freedom we enjoy to be able to be here and the health that we enjoy. I pray that you will be with Brother Joe as he brings the message and give him the words to say. We uh, offer these tithes and offerings to you and ask you to bless them and multiply them and glorify and honor your name through throughout the world. And uh, thank you for Jesus, and in his name we pray. Amen.
Einstein was dead, the savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him.
is why we are here, because the Lamb has overcome. He has overcome, and He has made you and I an overcomer. And it is important that, uh, that we remember this and that we stir one another up and live the way that we ought to live, you know. Uh, the Apostle Paul warned us and he said that, that the world will look at you and I and they will wonder. They will wonder why we do not rush in after them into the same flood of dissipation. You know that passage of Scripture? That's that flood of dissipation, what that passage means is that self-destructive pattern. You know, that's what it is, isn't it? This world has a lot of tempting fruits for us, but they are all deadly. They are all deadly. And that's because, you know, that's, that's the way, that's the effects of sin. The sin leads to death. And uh, we're here this morning to remember the cause. That's the title of this sermon. Remember the cause was the battle cry of the American Revolution. This was, these three words, General George Washington said over and over again to his men because he knew that they were fighting for a purpose. They were not just fighting for their land. They were not just fighting to defend themselves. They were fighting for a cause. And when you can get behind a cause and you believe in it with all your heart, then you know that it's bigger than you are. That it's, it, it matters more than you matter. And here today, we have to remind ourselves of that. You know, we get caught up and we get so busy in life, don't we? We get busy with our jobs. We get busy with our agenda, our to-do list, and all the things that come with being in this world, you know. But we have to remember that we live for something that's so much bigger, so much greater, so much more important than our life. And that is the cause of Christ. In the end, that's all that will matter. That's all that will remain is the cause of Christ. So do not, let your, do not let the things of this world distract you from your primary purpose in life. Your primary purpose in life is to tell this world about Jesus Christ. That is what we're here for. That, you know, the Apostle Paul, when he had to go to the church in Corinth, and he had to set them straight, he said, you know, y'all are so impressed with with." people and how educated they are you're impressed with Apollos some of you say that you're disciples of Apollos some of you say that you're disciples of me I don't really care because I would rather come to you and speak five words about Christ about the cross man how humble do we have to get to be truly useful to God that's what it requires we have to humble ourselves so I want, to, I, want to, I want you to imagine something this morning. I want you to imagine, if you will, with me, a very realistic scenario that some people are faced with. Imagine that you are going to the doctor tomorrow. Okay, some of you may be. I don't really know if you are. No one's told me. Okay, but some of you might be going to the doctor. Now imagine that you are given the news, the grim news, that you only have two more years left. No matter what they do, at best, you got two more years. I mean, just let that thought sit on you for a second. Some of us feel like we have a bunch of time, you know. I remember my, my, grandpa, my grandfather saying, well, we called him granddad. My granddad used to tell me this. He said this to me once, and it, and it just really gripped my heart because, it, you know, he was on his deathbed when he said this. He said, when you're a young man, you feel like you're going to live forever. You feel like you have all the time in the world to figure it out, but it comes quick. Don't forget that. So imagine you've got two years. You've been given that sentence. How would that affect your decision making? How would that change your priorities? Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm really being honest, that's what I'm trying to be this morning, right? I'm trying to be honest here, I think I would care less about foosball, baseball. I mean, I was pretty excited last night, I'll, I'll admit. 
may have jumped up and done a happy dance a time or two. But, um, but if I'm really being honest, and I knew that that's all I had left were two more years of life, I think I'd care less about that sort of thing. And I would be honest with you, too, I, I think I would... You know, I think I would listen to the news less, watch the news less, and read the Bible more. And, you know, uh, I pastored a, a church not too far from here for about seven years. And um, in that time, I got to pastor, minister to two men who were on their last, last few laps around. And I can honestly say that seeing that for myself, every time I would go to visit them, they had the Word of God out in front of them. You know, they were so ready to share the gospel. But sadly, they didn't have very many opportunities. Not like you and I do. I mean, they were, they were homebound. They weren't able to go out and hold the light of the, the, the Word of God out into this world. So let that, let, let that truth sink on you for a second. You and I, we, we get to go out there every day. But are you shining the light of God's Word into your world? You know, for me, tomorrow, that's, that's going to be uh, my classroom. You know, my kids genuinely do want to see me live out the truth of God's Word. They, they love it when I put a Bible verse on my whiteboard. They love it when I explain it to them. They've told me this. And so, take every opportunity to sow the good seed into this world. Because you don't want to have to regret that one day. I want to share with you a passage of Scripture. If you will, turn in your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Tim Timothy chapter 2. Timothy was the Apostle Paul's Son in the faith is what he called him. Son in the faith. Paul took Timothy under his wing and mentored him, taught him. Because he knew this man is going to be part of my legacy. And I want him to know how to do this. I want him to know how to be a pastor. I want him to know how to stay on the straight and narrow path. And listen to the words that he tells Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says this, No one engaged in warfare. Man, underline that in your Bibles this morning. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. How do you see yourself? You know? I gotta be honest with you, when I'm, when I'm getting ready to go to work, I don't often think of myself as a soldier of the Lord. But that's what you are. You are boots on the ground. You are boots on the ground. You are the hands and feet of the Lord, and you are in a fight every single day. You know, I get to see that fight up close because in our schools, with our youth, that's the enemy's front lines, in case you hadn't noticed. That's the enemy's front lines. He knows that if he can get them while they're young and he can divert them off the pathway, he can wreck this place. And that's exactly what he wants to do. He wants to wreck this place. Jesus said the enemy has come to do three things, to kill, steal, and destroy. He's not after your stuff. He wants to get his stuff. He wants to get his people. And he wants to derail the mission of the church. You're in a fight. You may not realize it. You may not want to think about it. But you can be like an ostrich, you can bury your head in the sand, you can, you can hide, hide and deny, but the truth is the truth. You and I are in a fight daily, and it's time for us to step up. It's time for us to step up and realize that we're in a fight, and we can't get too caught up 
and what we see going on around us. All those things are secondary. All those things are not important. My primary purpose is to be a light in this world for Jesus Christ. Let's turn now to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. I love this passage. I love this book. 1 John chapter 2 this morning. Verse 15 is where we'll be in 1 John chapter 2. Listen to these words. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. You see, this passage of Scripture really sobers up our thinking. You know, regardless of how much you uh, obtain for yourself, You know, regardless of how much you achieve for yourself in this world, all of it will pass away along with this world. The only thing that shall remain is the will of God. That's the only thing that will remain in the end. That's all that will stand. And the only thing that will be there for you and I is what we've done in Christ. That's it. That's all that shall remain. You know, last night I was, I was hooting and I was hollering for a World Series victory. But you know what? Next year they'll play another one. There'll be two other teams that'll be playing it, and, and one of them will win it. And then you know what? It won't matter. It won't matter a bit. The Cowboys, they might be in the Super Bowl this year. How exciting would that be? They might, okay? I really didn't mean that as a joke, but okay. (laughs) I see how it is. But even if they are, so what? In the end of the day, it's just a game. Do they get paid way too much to play? And none of it will matter. In the end, it will wash down the sink, so to speak, right? It won't matter. You know, all that ring, all those rings, all that bling, it, it, will, it, will, it won't stand. All that will remain is what is done for the Father and what is done in His name. And that's what Paul was trying to help Timothy understand when he said, don't get so caught up in what you see happening in this world. Don't let it distract you. Don't let it distract you. Don't let it discourage you either. I'm here to tell you that this morning. I know we see a lot of things that are discouraging. I come home every day discouraged by what I've observed in and amongst our youth. But that's why I feel so compelled to work with them. Because I know what they're up against is tough. It's tougher than what I went up against. You know, they live in a world that is so lost so lost and that's what it is let me tell you something everything that's going on in this world today it is secondary it's what the bible calls birth pangs right birth pangs labor pains and let me tell you what they are they are a manifestation they are a manifestation of a world that is estranged from its heavenly father that's what it is and it's your job it's my job to reintroduce them to their lost father, to the father they've lost contact with, you know. And so it's something that we should be delicate about, right? You know, if you you were to know someone who didn't know their father, and they had the opportunity to be reintroduced to him, I guarantee you that person would be nervous. I guarantee you that person would would find that difficult. Even though they might want to reconnect, 
they would be like, they would have all kinds of concerns, wouldn't they? They'd say, oh, I don't know. What if he doesn't like me? What if he thinks I'm a failure? Let me tell you something. There are people out there who want to be in here, but they're afraid. They're afraid. Don't shake your head at them. Don't say, oh, shame on them. I didn't see them at church today. They want to be here, but they're afraid to be here. And they're not necessarily afraid of you. They're afraid of how they feel they failed him. I was once in their shoes. I know what that's like. To feel like you've messed up. To feel like you're not good enough. But let me tell you something. My favorite story in the Bible is the parable of the prodigal son. I love that story so much. Because it reveals so much about the heart of the father. The father wants you to be here. The Father wants you to be connected to the family. He wants you to return home. He's waiting, eagerly anticipating that you'll come back here, that you'll come back here and be united with the family. He wants to be reunited with you. And so that's something that we have to take to heart. You know, just as a soldier called to duty is completely severed, from the normal affairs of civilian life, so also must the good soldier of Jesus Christ refuse to allow the things of the world to distract him. That's a quote from John MacArthur that I wanted to share with you. Don't be distracted. Refuse to be distracted. You have too big a job to do, too important a job to do. And by all means, don't get caught up in the things of this world. Because in the end, nobody's really going to care. Nobody's really going to remember the last time the Cowboys won the Super Bowl. I was in the sixth grade. I'm about to be 40 now, okay? <laughs> it was a long time ago. Nobody cares, right? Nobody cares. And if they win it again this year, there'll be another one next year, right? There'll be another one next year. But let me tell you something. You and I are possessors of something. Don't forget this. We possess something, the truth, right? Jesus Christ said this so, right? He said, the thing that will set us apart is my people will stand for the truth. You see, the world out there has itching ears. They want to hear what they want to hear. They want to see what they want to see. And that's what's so dangerous for our youth about this little thing right here. Right? Because if you don't tell them what they want to hear, I guarantee you they can find a face of someone on here telling them, affirming to them that what they think and what they believe is perfectly fine. Well, don't tell me Satan's not using that. He's using that. Uh, to his fullest advantage. But we have to as well, right? Don't be afraid to share what you're learning about God on, on, on Facebook or on social media, how, whatever one you've got there. I mean, the kids, the, you know, I, I joke with the kids at school to, to show them how old I am, and I was like, well, I'm on Facebook. Are you on Facebook? And they just laugh. Well, Facebook, are you for real? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm on. They're like, my, my parents are on that. <laughs> okay. Is that a shot at me? Okay. But um, use whatever you've got, okay? I actually do have a couple of students that I'm friends with on Facebook that I teach at school. So, you know, use whatever means you have to get the Word of God out there, to get the truth of God out there. Because listen to this. The only thing that repels darkness is the light. You possess the light. You're the only one that possesses it. They might think that this thing's a light. It puts off a light, right? No, it, it tickles their ears. It tells them what they want to hear. And that's what they're itching for. But your job in this world is to be the light, to shine the light of the gospel. Now I want to give you another example in Scripture here. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4.
in this passage, the Apostle Peter is standing boldly proclaiming the gospel to the Jewish people. And he is proclaiming it so boldly that they are taken off guard by the boldness with which he teaches. It reminded them of someone they had seen before that they thought was gone. Jesus, right? Thought they had gotten rid of that guy. But now they, they, could, they could swear by their eyes that they are seeing him again. Look at this verse, verse 12 G, uh, Peter proclaims, he says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen, Amen indeed. I had, a, I had a gentleman come forward one Sunday morning to accept Christ Jesus, and this was the passage I was preaching from, and he said, When I spoke, that word, he said he knew immediately in his heart he needed to accept Christ. You know, I heard a preacher put it like this. Greg Laurie said it this way. He said that the Scripture is like a time bomb. You know, you, you set a timer on the bomb, and it'll go off at some point in the future. It may go off quickly. It may take a while to go off. But think of Scripture that way. Don't be afraid to share it. You may share it with somebody and they may be like, you know, hey, that's okay for you. And now I'll go on about my way. That's okay for you to believe that. I believe something else. Don't ever underestimate the scripture. The Bible says it will not return void. It will go out and fulfill the purpose for which God intends it to fulfill. So proclaim it anyways, despite what you see with your own eyes. Don't believe your eyes. Believe the word of God. So there is, no, there is salvation in no other name except the name of Jesus. Verse 13, look at this very closely. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Listen, you won't fool this world into thinking you're the smartest person in the room. You won't fool people into believing that you're something that you're not. But show them Jesus in you. There is a boldness that comes from the Spirit of God. I've seen it. You've undoubtedly seen it before as well. That boldness doesn't come from just coming to church. That boldness doesn't come from just trying to be a good person, trying to do the best that you can. That boldness comes from being at the feet of Jesus. And you and I can draw near to him just like Peter and John did. You know, I, 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 I sometimes envy these guys that they got to be one of the twelve that they got to actually walk with Jesus. They got to hear him speak, hear him teach, witness these miracles that he performed. But let me tell you something. Jesus told them before he ascended into heaven, he said, it is better for me to go than for me to actually stay here with you. Because when I ascend, the Holy Spirit will descend and be amongst you. You see, you and I can gather at the feet of Jesus anytime. Anytime we desire, we can be at the feet of Jesus. When we get alone with Him in our quiet place, you know, for me, that's getting up before my kids because it's not a quiet place anymore once they get up. Okay? So get up before them. That's, that's step number one for me. And then get alone with God and His Word just me and him, and I open with prayer, and I ask the Heavenly Father, I ask the Holy Spirit to speak to me in terms that I can understand, because I'm like Peter, you know. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I'm not trying to fool anybody. But get along with him. Father, speak to me in a way that I can understand, and 
May your word change my heart. May your word embolden me today. And then I begin my studies. You know, something along those lines each and every day. And let me tell you something, I crave that time with God. Because I know I need it. I know that I need it. We all do. We all need to be at the feet of Jesus. We need to be instructed by His Word, and we need to be emboldened by His Spirit. And let me tell you something, when that happens, the world will look at you and notice that there's something quite different about you, because you know what you'll be? You'll be a soldier for Jesus. You'll be ready to go out and fight. So I guess I didn't, I didn't really think this out like, a, like it was a theme or anything, but I guess it kind of is this morning, you know. Uh, we're talking about General George Washington. But I got another general I want to tell you about. He had a nickname that was kind of cute. Old Blood and Guts. That's not that cute? Old Blood and Guts. General George S. Patton in World War II. He's not exactly someone you'd want to quote from the pulpit, uh, if you know anything about him. But one thing about him was this. His men were doggedly determined to fight for him. And, you know, sort of like all good generals, you've got Washington, you've also got Alexander the Great and General George S. Patton. They all had something in common with each other. They were willing to die for the cause. They were willing to die for the cause. Their men knew that. Their men had no question about that. They saw it. They saw it daily. And whenever Patton wanted to inspire his men, he had a jeep that he would jump in. And he would say, take me out to the front. I want them to see me in the front. I want them to know we're taking this hill. And he would do that just to fire his men up, just so they would know Washington did the same thing with his horse. Alexander the Great did the same thing on his horse. Whenever the men slowed down, whenever the fight got scary, he knew, now's the time I've got to take charge. Let me tell you something, church. We are living in scary times. We have an enemy who's wise as a serpent and harmful as a serpent. Far more harmful, honestly. And it is time for us to be at the feet of Jesus, getting charged, getting ready to go out there and be a soldier for Christ. So, daily, you and I need to make time to be alone with Jesus, our general, so that he can inspire us, so that he can direct us, so that he can condition our heart to be ready for the day ahead. Let me tell you something. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, did he? He did not. But I want to close this morning by turning you to one more passage of Scripture, John chapter 3. And maybe you're here this morning and you've been hearing all these things about Jesus and about being a soldier for him, but maybe you're thinking to yourself, man, I don't even really know if I'm a Christian. How do you really know? Well, as we wrap this up this morning, I want to turn you to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 17 is where I'm going to begin. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now let me just pause for a second and, and really explain what that verse is saying that the world through him might be saved. What that verse is telling us is that Jesus has already paid your debt. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't just die for me. He didn't just die for people who claim to be Christians. He died for all men. He died that all men might be saved. He died that we would all be forgiven. So we're already forgiven. But let me tell you something. When we place our faith in Jesus, that's when we accept the finished work of Christ. Those are the last three words Jesus said on the cross, isn't it? 
it is finished. And then he offered up his spirit. Let me tell you something. When you receive that message, when you receive the truth that Jesus Christ died for you so that you might be saved, that is what makes you a believer. That's what makes you a Christian. Look at what it also says in verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So he stands condemned already. And this is the condemnation, verse 19, that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You see, what it comes down to is what you're going to love more. Are you going to love your heavenly Father who is looking for you, is longing for you to come back home, to be his child, to be his son, to be his daughter? Or are you going to love this world more? Are you going to love what this thing here tells you you are and you want to be more than what his word promises? I don't know about you, but I need the grace of God. And I'm so thankful that Christ Jesus died for my sins because I know I've tried. I've tried to be a good person, and every time I try, I'm reminded of just how awful a person I can be in my heart. Because the Bible teaches us that that's where sin actually begins. It begins in the heart. It begins in the heart that murder is actually the same thing as hating or despising someone. That, that adultery doesn't actually have to be physically done, that it that actually starts when you lust for someone in your mind. And so the Bible teaches us that sin comes from the heart. Jesus taught his disciples, he said, it's not what goes into the body that defiles a man, but what comes out of his heart. That is the manifestation of what's wrong with him. Of course, that last part was me. But... Have you ever said something and thought, eee, I can't believe I just said that? Have you ever done something and thought, eee, I can't believe I just did that? Well, you're not alone. You're not alone. And Christ Jesus died so that you never have to be alone, so that you could be a part of the family of God. So this morning, if you're, if you're wondering, you know, what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, that's what it means. It means putting your faith and trust in what Christ did for you on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he made him who knew no sin to become sin for your sake, so that you might in exchange become the righteousness of God. Let me tell you something. That is the good news. For you and me this morning. If you've never truly received it in your heart this morning, we want to go into a time of invitation now and give you an opportunity to respond to the Lord. If you're hearing this message this morning and, and you feel that, that this is for you, that might be the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and I want to pray with you. I want to be there for you and help you uh, make a commitment to Christ this morning. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we just thank you for the cross. For without it, there would be no hope. But Lord, because of it, regardless of whatever struggle we are going through, we can stand knowing that we are your children, knowing that we are loved, and knowing that you will guide us no matter what troubles we face in this life. Lord, I pray that there's someone here this morning, maybe there's a, a family in need, there's a person in need, a struggle they've been going through. Lord, we just pray now that they would come forward receive the love and the prayers of this church family Lord we want to minister to anyone here this morning who is in need and Father if there's someone here this morning and they've heard this word and they know that they're not truly a Christian they know that they've never truly prayed to ask Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior Lord I pray that they take that, that step of faith this morning to come forward and receive him today come just as they are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.